Australia has large interests and large commitments in the Middle East, and I have recently been discussing with the general staff in London the possibility of utilizing to the full the very skilled and gallant services of the commander of the Australian Imperial Force, Lieutenant General Sir Thomas Blamey. It is with great satisfaction that I am able to tell you that General Blamey's handling of the forces in Greece has called forth the very highest praise from General Wavell, and that it has been decided that he shall be appointed Deputy Commander-in-Chief of the whole of the Middle East. This will, I know, give pleasure to all my countrymen, for it will assure to us an effective voice by our own leader in the making of decisions which are of such moment to Australians. Meanwhile, the tide of battle ebbs and flows. Only a few weeks ago, from the Middle East, I was able to speak to you with joy of notable Australian victories in Libya. Today, we are all watching anxiously the progress of events in Greece and in Libya, in each of which countries our soldiers are fighting magnificent defensive action. I had anticipated that before now, I should be on my way back to Australia, fortified by the most remarkable experiences of my life. But I did not feel, nor did Mr. Churchill, that it was right for me to be travelling at a time when great decisions have to be made regarding the movements of Australian forces and the conduct of what may well turn out to be the vital stage of the war. First, let me say something about Libya. For reasons which you will at once understand, it isn't possible for me to discuss the size of military forces, their disposition or their equipment. But I can say this, that operating from Tripoli, the German has developed an attack in Libya of a much greater severity than had ever been anticipated by our military advisers. Every possible step is being taken to arrest it, and for the moment it seems to be halted. The Navy is pursuing an aggressive policy, has just bombarded Tripoli, and, as you know, a few nights ago, sank an important convoy. The Air Force, which is being rapidly reinforced, is doing magnificently. We may be sure that all the British forces in this zone will fight with valour and skill. We will do best by backing them up with resoluteness, energy and cheerful spirits. I know that it will not be said hereafter that adversity changed our cheering into grumbling, or that while the battle was still raging, we began to cast about us for a scapegoat. Second, let me say something of Greece. The momentous question of whether we should go there was discussed at the first war cabinet that I attended in London. It was the subject of extensive communications between the governments of the United Kingdom, Australia and New Zealand. And so far as I was concerned, between myself and my colleagues in Australia, Anxious consideration was given to every aspect of the matter. Every question that could properly be raised was raised, examined, and debated. The best advice was obtained from the generals who were on the spot, notably Sir John Dill, the Chief of the Imperial General Staff, and Sir Archibald Wavell. As a result of our investigations, we all came to the conclusion that, though assisting Greece with soldiers was a hazardous undertaking, it was one which had some real prospects of military success. Further, we were of opinion, as I still am, that to desert the Greeks just as the Germans were about to attack them would have been one of the infamies of history. Who could contemplate that the great British Empire should encourage and cheer the Greeks in their resistance to Italian aggression and then leave them with a shrug of the shoulders when the German aggressor came along? The truth is that if we had refused to go into Greece, we would have been legitimately subject to a storm of criticism all over the world, and would have lost some of our own self-respect. And once we decided that Greece should be helped, the last thing that Australia would desire would be that the help should come from others and not from her. No man is more distressed than I am at the idea of friends and fellow countrymen having over their lives and homes the shadow which battle brings. But I would be unworthy to represent 
a fighting people, a nation whose soldiers are known to be great soldiers the world over. If I hesitated on a great occasion like this, I repeat, it was our duty to help Greece. It was also the duty of some of us, the urgent duty, the imperative duty, to see that every possible step should be taken to make our intervention in Greece effective. But that didn't mean that we were to refuse to help Greece unless victory was assured. We were bound to accept great risks in a great cause. It is true that the Yugoslav forces, which might very well not have entered this war, but for our intervention in Greece, have been unable to resist the Germans. It's true that a sudden German thrust may have destroyed the Greek position in Albania, and so in that country, given to the Italians, a victory over the Greeks which they could never have been able to achieve by force of their own arms. But it is also true, and you will not fail to have it in mind, that great losses have been inflicted upon the Germans by what is known for the purposes of this campaign as the Anzac Corps, a corps in which Australians and New Zealanders, their brave and splendid colleagues, once more fight together, a corps which has performed and is performing as immortal deeds of war as those which were in classical days performed in the passes of Thermopylae. The stark and brutal truth is that we cannot win this war without losses, and in the last analysis, the only means of winning it is the killing of Germans. The Germans have vast forces, but they have many thousands less troops and many scores less of tanks and aeroplanes than when they began their drive against the Ali Ackman line. Since I came here, I have, both in London and elsewhere, found myself physically shaken and almost deafened by intense aerial bombardment. I have been fortunate. Thousands of other people have been killed and more thousands injured. Yet I have never heard one whisper of defeat. War has come very near home to the people of Great Britain. But when they see it, they are unafraid. I do not doubt that we Australians are of the same stuff. We will take whatever war may bring us because we are sustained by a true and unflinching faith which the apostles of an evil cause can never have. In these weeks, we are passing through the waters of tribulation. We may have to draw heavily upon our accumulated reserves of patience and courage and good cheer, but we shall come through. In the Middle East, where so many things now look dark, we may well win a notable victory. But the greater our difficulties, the more imperative it is that we should stand firm, that we should be united, resolute, and energetic. We may leave to lesser people the follies of recrimination and division while the battle rages. It is our job to fight the battle and to win it, and we will do that best by looking forward and not back. I am hoping that out of these trials will be born a new spirit of political as well as national unity in Australia. There is in Great Britain a tremendous feeling about what Australia has so far done in this war. The reception given to me in this country is in no sense a personal one. It is based upon the simple fact that I represent the country which has, by the courage and skill of its soldiers, sailors and airmen, and by the superb efforts of its factories, given a degree of encouragement to the people of Great Britain, which nobody who has not been here can even begin to realize. In the last nine months, over 30,000 men, women and children living peaceably in their homes in these islands have been killed in air raids. Yet the work goes on. The spirit is unquenched. The factories hum with renewed activity, and the workers smile at their toil. I have told them in your name that we are with them in foul weather as well as in fair.
in temporary defeat as well as in victory, until in his own time God delivers the world from the scourge that has been laid upon it.